Welcome to Criminally Speaking. We're a brand new true crime podcast. I'm Michelle Lee. I'm Ray DeWallaby. And we're your co-hosts. We're going to speak a little bit about why we're doing this. We are based in Rhode Island, which has quite a lot of true crime stories that have not been covered yet. We do hope to bring some awareness to crimes from our home state, as well as nationwide and around the globe both unsolved and solved plus we're going to cover historical if you want to use the word historical yep um the serial killers hopefully find some new stuff out yeah we'll update you on any breaking crime stories that have come out in that week like for example we're recording this on april 20th and today just happens to be the 20th anniversary of the massacre at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. So we do want to send our thoughts and prayers out to the folks in Littleton, all the families, the victims, and friends that were affected by that tragedy. So what we need to talk about is how we got into true crime. Events that took place and pretty much catapulted us into the darkness. Yes. So... Usually everyone has a story, so we're going to tell you ours. Michelle, go ahead. For me, um, I was a teen growing up in the 80s, kind of like Stranger Things, if you've ever seen that show. Um, And something pretty unusual happened to me. I've yet to come across anyone else that has a story like this. I was friendly with, not close friends, but close enough that we knew each other's names and saw each other on a semi-regular basis um, with a teenage serial killer. Um, He was a year younger than me. He played sports with my brother, so our paths crossed pretty often. He called me Debbie Gibson, which anybody in my age range will know, was a popular singer back in the day. And he thought it was funny, and so that's what he called me. And About a week after the second murders, my brother had a baseball banquet where um, they all came and got their trophies for their rewards for the season, and the parents came, and we had this nice catered dinner, and at the parents' table, there was no more room for me, so I got pushed over to the kids' table, unfortunately, and I was pretty much the oldest one around a bunch of kids that were like nine years old. I was like 15 or 16 at the time, 16. And two people happened to show up late to the event and there were no more seats with their team. So they had to sit at the kids table with the sisters and they were not happy about it. And one of them was a guy named Craig Price. We did know each other, like I said, our paths had crossed, we weren't close friends. Now, some people aren't gonna know who Craig Price is. Craig Price? was a 15 year old boy from Warwick, Rhode Island, where I grew up, who by the age of 15 had killed not only a 27 year old woman when he was 13 in 1987, but also a single mom and her two daughters in 1989, two years later, when he was only 15 years old. He'd already murdered four people. That back then, was not something that, like, nowadays you'll hear this a lot in the news, but back then it was unheard of for a teenager to be a serial killer. So the fact that he got away with it for two years, at only 13 years old, is um, it's pretty crazy. In fact, this was one of the first cases that I'm aware of that criminal profiling was used to try to come up with a suspect. Um, I believe it was McCrary from the FBI Behavioral Sciences Unit and Dr. Henry Lee, who ended up gaining fame in 1994 when he testified in the O.J. Simpson murder trial. So he was in my city. He was investigating the crime scene. They were trying to use forensics and behavioral sciences to try to come up with a suspect because it was clear to the police at this point that there was a serial killer on the loose. So it turned out that it was my friend. 
and we're going to spend episode one actually getting into the details of the story of Craig Price because a lot has happened since then and only recently has the story come to a conclusion so we have a lot of information for you about that and it has a really personal connection for me which absolutely got me interested in the psychology of people because he was the kind of person that was funny that was fun to be around I never would have suspected him he would have been the last person I expected would have done this so it made me wonder if someone like him is capable of that what about everyone else that I know who exactly are you standing next to in the market exactly the laundromat yes who do you work with who do you who, work with who, who do you go on your first date with no. especially for women women you understand for us it's a whole different level of scary when you're meeting someone you don't know so when i come from a background where anybody could be a serial killer <laughs> literally it's um it's a different way to grow up so ray what got you interested in true crime hmm well a lot of high-profile cases happened when I was between the ages of 5 and 12. So, and then prior to even being conscious of it, the first thing that I ever saw that creeped me out as a kid but infatuated me was Helter Skelter, the mm -hmm. miniseries with Steve Railsback. He was great in that. He looked maniacal. Oh, God. Uh, my mother would go shopping at a chain that was popular in Rhode Island, Zare. Oh god, I remember that. So as a kid I would stand there and watch the TVs. Well, one day, or night I should say, I'm standing there, I, I don't even know how old I was when that came out, um, just I was watching it and they were showing the murders. Oh. For TV back then they were pretty, yeah. pretty gruesome. But it was like a chain of events after that. We talked to you and I talked about the Woodmancy case mm -hmm. and Jason Foreman, where Woodmancy actually killed this child and ate him. So, Ugh. as a child myself. And that was in Rhode Island also. That was in Rhode Island as well. And I was actually the age of Jason Foreman when it happened. So, he was five years old. I was five years old. And it was plastered all over the news. Mm -hmm. So, you've got that going on. And then within the same time frame, you've got Son of Sam. You've okay. got all of this stuff, and it's like just hearing about random shootings, people in cars. Mm -hmm. You know, your your mind is developing this fear, but yet intrigue. Mm -hmm. So throughout my childhood, there was like one after another after another, you know, all the way to Jeffrey Dahmer in yeah, 1990. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It was like a hotbed of serial killers in the 70s, 70s and 80s. 70s, 80s, and then the 90s. I mean, you know. Science kind of caught up to them. But they're still out there. They are. You had posted something that said there's a, suspect, a suspected serial killer in Chicago, Chicago going after yep. black women. Yep. And um, what about the... Uh, God, going back, the guy who put all the women in the barrels. But in New Hampshire? The, uh, no, I forget where it was. I've got to research a little bit more. But they, it was um, bondage-related. Oh. He would... The women would go to him and he signed themselves over as the he was the master and then he ended up just keeping them and killing them and putting them in barrels on his property. Oh my god, I, I I've mean, heard of that one. It's endless. That's why we're here. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. Oh. He was the, probably, aside from Craig, the first serial killer that I was really aware of and he terrified me. Well, he was high does. profile. Yeah. He was all over the news, so you couldn't help but know what was going on because of his escape. His antics. Yeah. They... He represented himself in court. After he escaped. And then, yes, and then he would question witnesses and make them describe in detail the condition the bodies were left. And people that were in the court said they noticed he was, like, physically aroused. Mm, it yeah. was just really gruesome. Creepy course it was his constitutional right and he did want to be a lawyer he's a really brilliant guy but had he had that problem. psychopathy he was probably he had a problem yeah a little problem a yeah. small problem he couldn't not kill yeah it's and i remember the execution control. me too i remember that and everybody but what was you know it was ironic 
was the fact the mob mentality about his execution. It kind of was like they were no better than he was. Yeah, I remember uh, news stories with people standing outside with signs, signs like fry t-shirts, and fry like, Ted, burn Ted, burn. And yeah, it was like, it was like a, a big media event back then. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that, I mean, obviously all he had lots of victims that were women and he was really brazen about it, but that what I think his final victim was a 12 year old girl named Kimberly Leach in Florida. Uh, and that's what, that's what did him in. Yes. When you cross into the children, it's well, a whole different ballgame. Also, Florida is death penalty row. Right. So it's like if you commit a murder in Florida, you are going to the electric chair. And he had to know that. He just had no impulse control. He just could not handle being around women. And as long as he was on the loose, he was going to kill them. Did you happen to see the um, Bundy tapes? Yes. I think it was on Netflix. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was pretty fascinating. That was awesome. And scary. It's, it's, and he still did hold back a lot. We'll never know the whole story with him. I'm sure there's countless victims. That... Well, the, the whole basis of the whole thing was it was almost like the OJ book. What if I did it? Yes. And that's how they got him to talk. Right. They got him to talk and say, all right, hypothetically, Ted, right. if you were to do this, not saying that you did, but if you were to, what would you do? Ugh. And that's just basically... It. But he loved to, to talk about himself. And what they said was, I remember the guy who interviewed him said he picked up the tape recorder and cradled it. Really? He cradled I it. I don't remember that part. Yeah, he cradled it to himself when he was talking. Mm -hmm. So it was like he, he was finally able to talk about it without talking about it. They say that about BTK, too, um, which... What we're talking about now is the BTK. Yes. The BTK killer in Wichita, Kansas. Um, did you happen to watch when they caught him when he was in court? I did. I, uh, I'm going back on memory, which now at my age is <laughs> starting to be painful. But um, he was just so arrogant. And he was also very excited to talk about the details of his crimes for the first time openly but and that's why they finally get caught they're proud of what they've done yes so well they're, they're proud all along and they i feel like a lot of their rage comes from the fact that they can't brag about it because they want that credit but right. they know they can't because if they do it's their freedom well, that's why they keep doing it to be in the news yeah so it's like the more they see it on the news the more credit they're getting it's just and then the i mean it's typical you see them in the movies how they're talking to the screen when they're mm -hmm. you know because they're like oh you got that wrong and it's like uh, this guy is his daughter has come out on the record and said that he did follow the case so i mean this he did this that they get off on that they watch it right out in the open and no one knows their secret so uh it's a really twisted mind that's capable of this and at one point all the profiles sounded similar they all said like a loner not able to form close bonds and we've since come to learn that that's not true like btk for example was married and had two children at the time of his arrest and at the time of the murders. So that entire 30 plus year span, he was raising a family. He was installing alarms in people's houses who were trying to keep BTK out. He was he was a pillar in the community. He yep. was he was he a was dog was, catcher. He was Which was law enforcement to Yes. Him. He thought he was law enforcement. Um yep. He had a criminal justice um, degree, I believe, from and, Wichita State University. And he was big in the church. He was the president. And he was also a scout leader. Like, on paper? This is someone you would trust your kids with, without question. And that goes to the... I was telling you about the movie The Clove Hitch Killer. Yes. Completely based on him, but not about him. Okay. So... Uh, I haven't watched it yet, but if I do. I do it, want you to. You will absolutely know. You, of course. Will yeah, know I took a you. really deep dive down that rabbit hole, and two of his victims were children. Being pregnant with your first child was really hard, so it messed with me for a while. I took a break from BTK for a long while, but 
I have heard that his daughter released a book in January, which I have not read yet, but I will probably read at some point to get that perspective of what it was like to grow up in that house. One of the things that I would like to stress, too, is we want to hear from you guys to know what you want us to talk about, what you want us to cover, um, because there's so much out there, but we need to know specifically what people want to hear. Right. As you know, we can go on and on if it's something that you you're unfamiliar with, but want to learn about. That's great. But we also want to know what you, as the listener, want to hear about. Right. You can feel free to recommend cases. I know some of you have already started to reach out to us on Twitter. Hi, Twitter. Thank you. We appreciate the support. Uh, wave. You, I'm literally waving to you. Ways I'm going to wave. Me. I'm going to wave to YouTube. <laughs> yeah, raise the YouTube master, and I'm on Twitter. So. I I'm a bad tweeter. Yeah, I'm it takes go a while on, to get I'm used gonna to. I'm going to go on the record as saying like I don't even know where to find stuff on Twitter. But yeah, but that's because they keep changing the algorithms and what shows up in your news feed and like it's just super bear annoying. with me. I'll get it. Same as us with podcasting. Neither one of us has ever done this before. This is the first time we're doing this. So, yeah, we sound like newbies. Because we gonna, are. We're going to get it. Don't worry. Yeah, like, in a couple of weeks, it'll be like we've been doing this forever. So, please bear with us if it's a little awkward. Um, if you have any feedback for us, feel free to reach out to our Twitter, which is at CriminallyPod. That's all I could fit. So, that's at CriminallyPod. And our YouTube page is... Criminally Speaking. Criminally Speaking. Feel free to subscribe. We appreciate that. Comment, like, let us know what you guys think. I'll um, try to make sure that there's actual video on there as well, not just podcast, because I like making videos. We actually fully intended today to get a video for you guys that we were super excited about that involves a drone. But... Because it is quite literally a dark and stormy night as we record this podcast, it was not feasible today. So we're going to reschedule that soon. Also, we have an email address. Which is... Criminally speaking at, at gmail.com. So feel free to contact us there. Again, we're always looking for feedback, any cases. The true crime is the genre, but if there's like missing persons, if there's... Anything in true crime that you want to know about, let us know. There's one case that I'm looking into right now that I've kind of been obsessed with for a while. The Maura Murray case out of New Hampshire. I know there's already a podcast dedicated to that case, but it's such a mystery to me and I relate to the girl. So that's one that I've been looking into recently. Uh, for episode one, we're going to cover the Craig Price story like we said. And we also intend every week to do a bonus episode, which will be exclusive for Patreons who support us. Unfortunately, there are costs involved in doing podcasts and we want to keep doing these, but we need support in order to make that happen. We haven't decided yet a final version of a Patreon. We're working out which tiered rewards we want to give you guys. So as soon as that's available, we will post that link for you as well. And thank you very much for listening. Spread the word. Share. Like. Comment. Email. Skywrite. Tweet us. Whatever you need to do. Pigeon carrier. Yeah, absolutely. Crows. Because <laughs> winter actually, is coming. It's coming. <laughs> Thanks for joining us tonight on Criminally Speaking. I am your co-host, Michelle Lee. And I'm Ray DeWallaby. We'll see you soon.